We are in a series called Made for This, and talking about moms, I know something moms and dads will love. I was here Wednesday night and saw the most amazing student experience where hundreds of students were together worshiping at our Unite worship service. It looked um, like this. Look, I don't know how well you can see this. This room is full of kids, and many of them made decisions for Christ. Some of them came to know Jesus for the very first time in their life this past Wednesday night. Let's give God praise for a revival in student ministry at our church. I couldn't be more happy about that. Now, we're in this thing called the Bible Engagement Project, and we're right, our program, and we are right at the book of Ruth, which landed perfectly for Mother's Day. Now, the thing about Ruth is there's an incredible story um, of Naomi, a mom, and it seems like that would be the perfect Mother's Day message, but there's also an incredible story of Ruth, and Ruth's story is about her trying to find true love. And I don't know why, but I, I, I just have to trust the Lord. I just felt like I was drawn to the Ruth part of this story. So that's where we're going to be today. Not talking so much about moms, but talking about love. And maybe it's because it's such a confusing time to try to meet someone and date someone and marry someone in a really, uh, you want to do that in a godly way and, and we're living in such an ungodly culture. You want to follow biblical guidance and we live in a culture that really doesn't care what the Bible says anymore. So how, how do you get there? And I've long said you find the love of your life where you worship. That's the smartest, best place to do it. Can I hear an Amen to that. I found the love of my life where I worship. And I know everybody's like, well, you can't do that because there's not enough people. The church doesn't have enough. There's just no girls. There's no guys in my church. Listen, my church had 25 people. Okay. God and probably my mom and me, we prayed someone in. Okay. Because most of those 25 people were related to me. So that was not an option because this is not a church in Tennessee. Okay. We... Couldn't do that, okay? Um, roll tight. Uh, so <laughs> God brought someone, okay? And so if you're looking to find someone in church, you're like, what, what kind of moves do you, do you use in church? Where you go, first you get a big Bible. Yeah. <laughs> you come in like to small group, you know? And you look over there at somebody that looks really good and you go, is it hot in here? <laughs> or is that the Holy Spirit burning inside of us? <laughs> <laughs> Write that down, boys. I promise you at work, all right? Uh, maybe you're at worship night and she's got her hands in the air and you happen to notice she is not wearing a wedding ring. You wait. You wait. Don't mess with her right there. But after, like maybe in the lobby, you're like, are you a Bible verse? Because I want to memorize you. <laughs> you like that? I've got more. I've got more. You can say something like, is your name Faith? Because you are the substance of things I've been hoping for. <laughs> It can be done. You just got special church moves, okay? It can be done right here in the house of God. But the truth is, culture's really changing. You know, it used to be sort of a, you get kind of dating, you meet someone, you marry, you have kids, and those standards kind of are not the same anymore. For the last five decades in this country, marriage rates have fallen by 60%. People aren't getting married. In fact, right now, 63% uh, of men under 30 say they don't want to get married at all. So if you're a young woman, you're under 30, and you're thinking, where are all the men? They're sitting on the sideline. I mean, statistically, they're saying, I don't, I don't want that hassle. I don't want to date. I don't want to get into all that thing. And maybe they're saying something like, why buy the cow when the milk is free? If you don't know what that means, ask your mama. She'll tell you after church, all right? 77% <laughs> of millennials uh, have decided we're going to live together. We're going to test drive this thing before we get married. And that makes a lot of common sense in our culture but it's also statistically proven that you're twice as likely to divorce when you do that. It's almost like God knew what he's talking about when he created the human race. <laughs> Doing it God's way is the right way. And, and here's the first lesson. I have several things in your notes today. I hope you keep up with these notes because a lot of stuff I want to say. And I think it's great to take it home, read it later, store it. I was, at, you know, I was at a church member's house years ago and I looked up and they had like all the Daystar notebooks with all the notes from forever. And they're like, I pull those down. I remember they're like a Bible study to me. So that's why we do this. We have little notebooks for you to keep this in. Here's the first thing I want you to remember. If you do what most people do, you'll get what most people get. It's that simple. Our culture has said, this is the direction our culture is going. And every measurable says this is a disaster. 
from anxiety to broken relationships to fatherless homes to so many jacked up things where our culture and we have so much more technology, so much more money, so much more possessions. Everything has progressed in a way that should make us happier, more blessed and more stable. And yet we have less of those most important things than we had in the 1950s. Our culture is headed in one direction. It's a disaster. And we wake up every morning and say, that sounds like a good idea. Let's have more of that. And we keep going in a godless direction. And if you want what most people do, just get up and do what everybody else is doing. Can you say amen? amen. You can say like, oh God, that got fast right at my face on Mother's Day. Sorry about that. Let's talk about Ruth, all right? So Ruth, the, culture, the story of Ruth is this. So it's a family of four husband, wife, uh, two sons, and they're living in Bethlehem, and that's a, a, a godly place, but there's a famine in the land, and so the father feels the pressure like, how are we going to survive? We've got to do something, so they move to a place called Moab. It's about 50 miles away. The problem with Moab is it's a godless culture founded uh, on incest, and they uh, worship this false god, Shemesh, and they sacrifice babies in the fire. It's, a, it's an awful place. God says, don't go there. He's already spoken to his people. But the dad feels the pressure. I've got to do something. Somehow we've got to survive. And so as the story goes on, years later, the boys marry Moabite women. But then the boys and the father die tragically. It's a tragic story. And so the, the women are left broke. They don't have money. They don't have property. They're alone and they're afraid. And finally, Naomi, the, the mother, says to her two daughters, hey, I, I can't produce you any more sons to marry. You're going to have to find a husband here somehow. I'm going back to Bethlehem. And then Ruth said the most famous line in the whole book of Ruth. Okay, there's not a lot of people, by the way, who have a book of the Bible named for them. Moses doesn't. But Ruth does, okay? And she says this famous line that if you've heard anything about her, you probably heard this where she says, where I go, she says to her mother-in-law, where I go, uh, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Amen. And so they moved back to Bethlehem. And this is a very symbolic story, okay? It doesn't matter if you live in Huntsville or Coleman or Birmingham, you can serve Jesus. But in these days, everybody who lived in Moab served a false god and everybody who lived in, in Bethlehem served the real God. So she said, you know what? We're going back to our roots. We're gonna get back to where we know and love the Lord, okay? And so that's what she does. They decide we're gonna move back and she's this new convert and, and she's decided, Ruth has, I'm gonna, I'm gonna worship the the one true living God. It's very important. Uh, and, and, and so, you know what? She's, she's still there hurting. She's still homeless and she still feels alone. And this is an important story wherever you are in your life because you may be hurting too. And this, there's really a bigger story here than the relationship part we're going to learn today. It's the story of God taking a person who has nothing and bringing him into a place of abundance. And if you feel like you're in a place where everything's gone wrong or you have nothing in, in the things you've been praying for or hoping for, this is a story that shows you that while chapter one can be a disaster, and it really was. It was a, they, they lost their faith. They left the people of God. They went to Moab. Then, then she lost her husband. And then those, uh, the, those girls lost their husband. It was a total chapter of loss. The good news is there's a chapter two. And things begin to change in chapter two. And if you get nothing out of this, I hope you get this big picture, is that no matter what this, per, this current season or chapter of your life looks like, God and only God has the power to turn the page for you. Yes, yes. Today can be a day where you turn the page and you don't Amen. stay where you are. She turns the page. Ruth says, I'm not gonna keep living here in Moab. This is terrible for me. And here's another lesson. And that is when you turn away from Moab, which represents sin, you'll find God's blessings in Bethlehem, which represents Amen. righteousness. Yes. There still has to be a turning, a desire. I'm not going to be what I was. So let's go on to chapter two. We've turned the page. Now, Naomi, this is the mother-in-law, remember, she had a relative on her husband's side. A Say the words underlined with me, everyone. A man of standing. Say it again. A man of standing. A man of what? Standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was what? Boaz. Everybody say Boaz. Boaz. 
All right, he's a man of standing. All right, uh, an, another translation says uh, he's a strong man of standing. He, he's, his integrity is strong. His, his courage is strong. His work ethic is strong. It also says that he has some wealth and, and he has some property. And let me stop right here and say, ladies, you want a man of standing and not a man of sitting. <laughs> Upstanding. Working, getting a job, doing what needs to be done. You don't want a passive, complacent man sitting around doing nothing, but you want a Boaz. Everybody say Boaz. 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 Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I saw it on the internet. (laughs) And it might be helpful to some of you girls out there trying to find someone. You want a man like Boaz. Boaz has some ungodly relatives, some cousins you might have heard about. I made a list of them that I found on the internet. He's got a cousin named (laughs) Brokaz. You don't want him Poaz, lying ass. Some of y'all, che- you redated that guy, didn't you? You found out. Cheating ass is the first cousin of dumb ass, and you dated drunk ass. You don't want that guy, lazy ass, and especially don't date his third cousin, beating your ass. Wait on your Boaz and make sure he respects your ass. Is that all right on Mother's Day? I don't... I'm, my mom's sitting on this side of the room. I'm going to preach to this side of the room for a little while. Okay. All right, so there's a Boaz righteous man for you, but you can't compromise with the wrong man. Let's get this off the stage quickly. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi. Okay, Ruth. All right, Ruth is the, remember, that's the daughter-in-law. She's from Moab. She's come to Bethlehem. She wants to learn and serve the true God. She said to her mother-in-law, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So Ruth went out, entered a field, and began to glean. Everybody say glean. Glean. She began to glean behind the harvesters. Now, gleaning is something you read about in, in Leviticus 19. And when they are harvesting the grain and the crops and the wheat, there's always pieces that are dropped. You're you're scooping, you're getting as much as you can. And then the the right thing to do is after you've cleaned the whole field, go back and pick up the leftover pieces. But God ordered his people to leave the leftover pieces for people who had no land and had no crops, for widows, orphans, uh, ex-prisoners who had no rights, homeless people, sick people. Uh, and, and it was a beautiful process of, of saying, we're going to care for you, but we're also going to let you go to work. You can see God, uh, God could teach government something. Can I hear an amen to that? Yeah. So they could work and feel confident and, and, and feel good about themselves, but also they could get some help. It was kind of like a soup kitchen, if, if you want to look at it like that. Um, And so this is what she's doing. She's picking up these leftover pieces. Now, the next verse says this. So Ruth went out to gather grain behind the harvesters. And everybody say that with me. As it happened. Actually, there's another translation that says, it just so happened. Everybody say that. It just so happened that she found herself working. Remember, she's trying to find any field of anybody kind enough to leave something behind. She just so happened to find herself working in the field that belonged to Boaz, the relative of her father-in-law, Elimelech. Now, this was really important. It just so happened. Nothing in the book of Ruth is like supernatural miracles. There's no parting of the Red Sea, no uh, burning bush. There's no voice from heaven speaking. But what you do find in the book of Ruth is what you find more often in your life, and that is the supernatural providence of God. What, what is the providence? I'm not talking supernatural like miracles, somebody walking on water. Here's, here's a definition you should know because you should look for this in your own life. The providence of God is when God uses natural circumstances to bring about his supernatural plans. You need to be watching for that every day in your life. Things work out and you say, well, it just so happened. It didn't just so happen. God dropped those uh, those opportunities right in your lap. God planned it before you in ways you didn't even see it happening. God orders those things. As I was thinking about just so happened moments, I I was thinking about how it just so happened that I met a pastor named Randy Smith when I just felt the call of God to be a pastor. All I knew is God called me to be a pastor. I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know how to do that. There's no way I was going to figure it out. I didn't have somebody to help me. But I just so happened to go to a prayer conference And when the preacher gave the invitation, 
I went to the front and I was praying. I was laying across the kneeling bench and I just, I was just praying until I felt and, and, and felt like I, I had met God. I didn't know the service was over. The pastor had dismissed. People were leaving and I was still praying, but it just so happened that one of those pastors at that conference sat, he said, I'm gonna sit on this front row and see how long that young boy prays. And when I stood up, it just so happened, I met the first ministry mentor who taught me how to be a pastor. He said, hey, would you like to be a youth pastor? I said, I don't know what that is. I've never met one, but I'd love to be one. I was the first youth pastor I ever met. I, you know, it just so happened that a pastor who had been a youth pastor for something like 20 years just happened to be the one who noticed that I was praying and seeking God. And it wasn't long after that, it just so happened in a restaurant, I met Pastor Henry McDuffie, who was a lifetime mentor of mine. You know what? In a really, really small church with less than this many people in this little section right here, it just so happened I met the love of my life. And those two pastors and that woman that I married are the three most important connections I've ever made in my life. And they all just so happened. There was no supernatural miracle. There was no booming voice from heaven. There was none of that kind of stuff. But God was in the middle of it all guiding and directing my steps. And what I've learned is if I believe in the supernatural providence of God, it'll, I'll see more of that in my life. I don't give praise and glory to, to luck. Boy, I just got lucky. Really? I don't believe that at all. I think God ordained the, the steps of his sons and daughters, and he ordered my steps to be where I was. Amen. Yes. Yeah, give God praise if you've seen that in your own life. Supernatural connections. Here's what the Bible says about that. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for their life. Just so happened she was in Boaz's field. And she met a man of standing. Here's what I have learned, two lessons about that. I've learned right things happen when you're in the right place. I made those three godly connections. I didn't make any of those godly connections at a nightclub or a frat party. Just didn't, you know, I'm not saying I've never been to either one of those places, but I didn't have any godly connections when I was there. Some of y'all have made some connections. How's that working out for you? Right things happen when you're in the right place and right things happen when you're doing the right things. What are you doing? Are you doing the right things? Are you making the right steps? Are you doing the things that are right for your life? While all this chaos is going on in chapter one, they're leaving uh, the, the, the house of God, Bethlehem. They're going to the wrong place. The, the husband is dying. The two sons are dying. All this chaos happens. You know what Naomi's doing? She's praying. Go back and read chapter one. Naomi is a prayer warrior. That mother is praying for her daughters-in-law. She's already lost her husband. She's lost her sons. For sure she prayed for them. She's left now only with daughters-in-law. What does she do? Does she get bitter? Does she get mad? Does she give up? No, she keeps praying. She prays for her daughters to find godly husbands. You know, my wife still has a prayer journal of before we met where she prayed of who she would marry and she wrote her prayers down. She prayed for a man who loves God and will be a leader, be a spiritual guide for her family one day. She even wrote down that she prayed he'd be at least six feet tall. <laughs> and would have a narrow waist. It started that way too. She, she wrote all those, th and that he'd have black hair. She amended it later to say, or brown. I just slid in under the wire. She made that change before she met me, okay? In fact, we were in our hometown long, uh, not long ago, and we, we were at Food World, and we saw one of Leslie's old boyfriends. He was pushing the buggies around. He's like a buggy boy, and I said, honey, look at that. <laughs> you could have been with a Food World buggy boy, but you with me, the pastor of Daystar Church. I said, what if you'd ended up with him? She said, well, then you'd be a buggy boy and he'd be the pastor of Daystar Church. <laughs> okay, that did not happen. I made that up. I'm sorry. But I feel like that's what she would have said if we had to run into Donnie. The, the right things happen when you're in the right place. So she's in the right place. Good things start to happen. Verse four, while she was there, Boaz arrives from Bethlehem. And he greeted the harvesters. And look at the first word out of his mouth. The Lord be with you. 
The Lord bless you, the harvesters replied. I, I just wanted to point this out as we're reading the story. First thing out of his lips, he's talking about the Lord. Listen, if you're looking for somebody, you're looking for the right person to date and to marry, how often and how early do they talk about the Lord? If that's valuable to them, if all they can talk about is NASCAR, road tide, that's all they want to talk about, them darn Democrats, if that's all they want to talk about, God's probably way down the list on their level of priorities. Don't get quiet because I tell the truth all the time. It's the truth. But somebody who truly loves the Lord, man, you'll hear them talk about their small group. They'll talk about the Lord. They'll talk about worship, scripture. They'll talk about church. You know, you, you ought to be a person who talks about that. And you ought to be looking for someone that that's valuable. And what I love about Boaz is he's not a priest or a prophet or anything like not a minister, but he ministers where he is. He's a minister in the workplace. He's a minister in the field, and you can be too. You can be a minister at school. You can be a minister in your friend group. You can be a minister where you work or in your family. You minister in a small group, okay? Ruth didn't have everything going for her. If he'd been checking her out on her profile page, it'd have been like, uh, Moab. I worship false gods over there, you know? It would have been like, she's, she's homeless, and she's got her mother-in-law. She's out, you know? You know, she's, uh, she's a widow. People don't, didn't marry widows. People didn't marry non-virgins in those days. But Ruth did not let her past determine her future. And if you take anything away from Ruth, don't draw a line over your life and say, well, I'm deleted, I'm no good, I can't get the right kind. Pastor, I love that you're talking about all these righteous men, but because of my past, I'll never have one of those. No, Ruth is in the book so that you know your past doesn't determine your future. Amen. That's why she has her own book of the Bible. So look, look, look at this. Look at this next statement. Verse 5, Boaz talked to his foreman and said, who is that young woman over there? Who does she belong to? And the foreman replied, she's a young woman from Moab who came back with Naomi. And she asked me this morning if she could gather grain behind the harvesters. And she's been hard at work ever since. She stands out. He notices her. That hard work, that ethic, that commitment. Man, you want to look for a woman that stands out among the other women, and I don't mean because her leggings are tighter than the other women's leggings. You can't get them no tighter than they are these days. Or they, the lip injections are fatter than the other. Yet that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for a woman of character. Look at the things that Boaz was attracted to in Ruth. She's faithful to God. She, I mean, she left a life of sin in Moab to come to a life of righteousness among the people of God. Guys, the number one priority you're looking for in a woman is a woman who loves the Lord. Her capacity to love you is fueled by her capacity to love the Lord. If she loves the Lord, she, she'll not stop loving you because of mistakes that you've made or because of changes in who you are. If, if she's into you because of that long, luscious, thick, flowing hair, she had not lived long enough to know, you know, about a 50-50 chance that ain't going to be around. <laughs> she's into you for your money. You can lose your money, right? All right? But if she's into you because she has a relationship with God, that gets stronger and better as the years go on. She, she's faithful to God. She's loyal to her family. You know, he noticed how she stuck it out with her mother-in-law and came back. She's a hard worker. She wasn't a beggar. She wasn't trying to play the role of a victim. She was truly working. She was trying to make herself better, and she honored God morally. What you may not know is in these days, most of the prostitutes were widows. They, they felt trapped. They couldn't survive. They're, they're trying to you know, find a way to work, to find grain left on the ground. That's hard work. It's difficult to find. They, they would be uh, mistreated and abused. And Ruth had higher standards for herself. She said, you know what? It's not going to be easy, but I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to honor God with my life. Ladies, if you want to have something different, you need to be something different. Men will, the right man will notice. Well, the men only notice this. Men only notice that. Well, that's the wrong men. It's a great thing that they don't notice you because they're the wrong man anyways. I always told my daughters, you just need one. Well, all the guys are so-and-so and all the guys, no, they're not all. Most of them are, but we just need one for you and one righteous one. And God is still raising up righteous, godly men. Amen. Amen. 
They're not dating you when you're dating the wrong goober. They move right on, and you miss them. I mean, I, I got plenty written down without just going off my head, all right? Boaz went over to see Ruth, and he said, Listen, my daughter, stay right here with us when you gather grain, and don't go away to any other fields. I have warned the young men not to treat you roughly, which was the common practice. Be careful with her. And when you're thirsty, help yourself to the water that they have drawn from the well. Immediately, ladies, you see how he's protecting her. He doesn't even know her. He's protecting her. He's watching out for her. And then he starts to pray for her. The very next verse, or verse 12 rather, may the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to find refuge. He, he's, he's showing what kind of a person he is. And so she's attracted to those things. Look at what Ruth is attracted to, that he honors her. He doesn't treat her like a sex object. He walks up to her and has a conversation. He doesn't slide into her DMs. What's up, girl? <laughs> Freaking moron. <laughs> Stand up. He's probably laying down when he did that, had his headphones on playing video games. What's up? <laughs> you're not up. You're a loser. <laughs> Calling my daughter again. <laughs> he honors her. He protects her. He, you know, a real man will protect a woman's purity. Amen. He'll value what she values, and he'll protect her heart, and he'll not pressure her, you know. Uh, he provides for her. He, he, he says, you, you can stay right here in this field. You'll be taken care of. I don't know. You might call it old-fashioned, but I think a man ought to pay for the meal. He ought to provide. He ought to take care. He ought to open the door. If you're walking down the street, you ought to notice which way the traffic's coming, and you stand between her and the traffic. It's your job to give your life for a woman there's a difference in a man and a woman do you know that and the blending of the genders is not for our good it's destructive and damaging and backwards and it's ungodly if you're a man man you are called to be righteous it's not toxic to be masculine it's your calling it's what this culture needs it's in your DNA stand up and be a man of God the world needs you You don't have to take her to Ruth's Chris. I mean, if you can only afford Taco Bell, pay for that cat food and, and have it. <laughs> Roll it up in a piece of paper. All right, and he prays for her. Let me say this again. If you have a man who prays for you, his source of love for you won't be you, it'll be God. Too many people, the source of what they call love. And don't get me started on, on God's definition of love versus our world's definition. But their source of love is what you can give them. Your sexuality, your good looks, the way you serve, the way you make them feel. What if you, for some reason, you can't give them that anymore? Well, then the whole relationship's in trouble. But if their source of love is God, who the Bible says is love. And in God, there is no lack did you know that? So there's no lack of love. If that's your source, then you've got what you can depend on. Last thing I'll say about this, if you're trying to find the right person, the fastest way to find the right person is to be the right person. Amen. I've heard so many people say things like, you know, I just, you know, I, I know he's going to make a, a fine young man. He just needs a, a good woman to straighten him out. Let me tell you something. A good woman is not looking for a project. She's looking for a partner, not a problem. You want to find a godly woman? Be a godly man. They'll be looking for you. It's like catching fish in a barrel. So many knuckleheads around here, you'll stand out. You want to find a godly man? Be a godly woman. You will stand out in a crowd. Because a godly man is not praying for somebody to straighten out. A godly man is praying for a godly woman. And a godly woman is praying for a godly man. You think, well, I'm just praying and God's going to send me the right person. I'm gonna, and when that happens, I'll really straighten up. I'll be a better person. No, that's not how it works, bro. You get your crap together right here, right now, and God will start sending you who you need. All right, let me leave you this last verse right here. This really is the picture of the story of Boaz. I really need about five weeks to tell you the story of Boaz and Ruth and Naomi. There's so many stories in here. But the overarching theme is right here. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here and have some bread and dip it in wine and vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. And here's the line. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. The story of Ruth 
is a woman who came from sin and poverty and moved to righteousness and abundance. She ate all she wanted. When this, in chapter one, she is literally starving. But when they turn the page to chapter two, she has eaten all she wants and she has something left over. And, and, and Boaz is called a kinsman redeemer. A kins, I don't even have time to tell you all about that. But he represents Christ. He is an archetype of, of the coming Christ. He, he is pointing us toward what you will do when you become the bride of Christ. And you don't give yourself to sin. You don't give yourself to Moab, but you give yourself to Christ. He will take you from poverty to abundance. You'll go from loss and destitution to victory and abundance when you come to know Jesus. Does anybody know I'm right about that? He's a God of abundance. They called him El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. If you are consumed with debt, God can bring abundance to your life. If you're consumed with anxiety, God can bring peace to your life. If you're consumed with relationship trauma, he can bring marital harmony and hope to your future. Only God can do that. You Listen, this, this story gives us a lot of things that you can do to fix things. Absolutely. But only God can do the supernatural in your life. You do what you can do, and you trust God to do the supernatural in your life. I just feel compelled to pray for people today who feel like absolutely God is taking me to chapter two in my life. 